Good afternoon. Welcome to the second annual Wild Wisconsin Winter Web Conference. Uh, whether you are just joining in or have listened to a previous session this morning, we are very glad you're here. My name is Jamie Machik, and I'm with the Nicolay Federated Library System in Green Bay, Wisconsin. So my system, and along with 13 other library systems in Wisconsin, are bringing you this conference virtually, and we do hope uh, that you enjoy it. So our next presentation um, coming up, we're shifting to the West Coast, um, where it's late morning there. Um, we have our Audrey Barbakoff with us. Audrey is the Adult Services Librarian at the Bainbridge Island Branch of the Kitsap Regional Library in Seattle, Washington. And she's going to talk about adult programming. So Audrey, uh, whenever you are ready. Well, well thanks, Jamie. Um, and Thanks to everyone for joining me at this Wild Wisconsin web conference session. Adults just want to have fun re-energizing adult programming. And uh, thanks to the Nicolay Federated Library System and its partners for having me here today. Um, so Jamie gave me a very nice introduction, but before we get going, I'll just give you a little bit on um, a little bit of context so that you know what we're going to delve into. So I'm an adult services librarian and manager on Bainbridge Island, just about half an hour from Seattle. And over the last couple of years, I've been focusing really heavily on amping up our adult programming to create fun, immersive experiences that attract adults of all ages. Most of our attendees are people who are kids or people who have kids and then seniors. Um, so I started trying to reach out to this underserved adult population. And along the way, I've really come to think about adult programming in a different way, and I'm really excited to share that with you, because a lot of what I'm doing is just common sense, spiced up with a little bit of enthusiasm and just a little bit of out-of-the-box thinking. I've borrowed and adapted a ton of ideas from fantastic librarians, and you probably are already doing things that are just as interesting. So my plan for today is to help you frame the amazing things that you do in a new and exciting way, and for us to have a chance to share some ideas and get excited together. All right, so to that end, here's what we're doing for the rest of this hour. We'll talk a little bit about what exactly we mean when we talk about learning, and uh, then I'll share the three factors that I've observed are the most important in creating successful, fun, and meaningful adult programming, getting dirty, getting together, and getting out. Uh, in each case, I'll give you a few samples of my own programs, and then we'll have a little time to share following each section and some Q&A at the end. All right. You must have learned what you have learned about learning. So when I say we're going to talk about programs for adult learning or education, the picture that you have in your head is probably not very exciting. When we talk about adult learning, we tend to think it looks like this or this. But this is a really old-fashioned notion, and it creates this very weird double standard for how we think adults learn versus how we know children learn. I mean, would you ever think that a child was learning if he looked like this? Of course not. So why do we think that that is the best way for adults? Learning by lectures and PowerPoint and a rigorous study isn't going to engage most of those non-academic adults in your community, especially working adults who are busy with jobs and social lives and families. We know that learning looks like this. So it should also look like this. And this. Right, so we tend to think that adult learning and fun are separate, but that is an absolutely false dichotomy. Just like kids, adults learn better when they play, when they read, and think and discuss because they're engaged with all their senses and excited, not because they feel obligated to learn something. So if we want to encourage lifelong learning, if we're really going to think about what that means beyond some stuffy line in our mission statements, that means fun. That means being a place where people come to dream and grow, invent, jump, yell, try, fail spectacularly. Fun is the best way to attract new participants. And it's also a critical way for all your patrons of all ages to keep on learning. So language is really powerful. Right? 
Realizing that fun and play are there to enhance learning, not detract from it, is really critical because it allows us to talk about our fun adult programs as meaningful educational experiences. This imbues our programs with an importance that just does not get attributed to the normal crafter circle. So why is that important? To get funding! Yay, funding and support for these programs. The way you talk about them really matters. Your understanding that you're creating a resilient community and supporting truly lifelong learning will show when you communicate your ideas to your manager, your board, your funding body, your government, your patrons. For a real eye-opener on the impact that reframing your language can have, absolutely do not miss the article, uh, Transforming Our Image Through Words That Work, Perception is Everything. That's by Valerie J. Gross, and it came from the 2009 September-October Public Libraries. Uh, and don't worry about catching that. I'm going to have a slide with resources at the end of this presentation. So let's start already by having you jump into the ball pit. Um, in the chat box, uh, add some of your own ideas for programs that you've done or that you'd like to do where learning and fun collide for adults. Um, so what are you already doing or what would you like to do? And just go ahead and type those in. I'll pipe down for a minute. Okay, so as Audrey said, um, if you would type some responses in your question box, um, things that you have done for adults or things that you would like to do. And we'll take a look at those. Okay, so I'm seeing, Audrey, a local garden tour, a movie with popcorn and film expert. Um, someone held a pop-up engineering workshop that was very successful. Um, a jewelry class, speed dating, um, Vimeo presentation, um, monthly trivia night, book club for 20 to 40-year-olds, perhaps at a bar. <laughs> Excellent. Um, these are all amazing. You guys are already doing such fantastic things. Um, oh, Downtown so, Abbey Tea Party. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. All right. Are there still any coming in or is it slowing down? There are. I'll read a few more. Um, let's see. Capture the Flag with Nerf Blasters. Uh, yes. uh, <laughs> a scrolling program, Wednesday morning coffee hour, um, community, garden, community garden tour. Um, we have adults meet every Friday morning to walk around the village, antique road show, couponing, potato stamping, knitting club, card making, travel talks. We had a string quartet in that was very popular. So lots, of good, I mean, lots of good things. Yeah, these are amazing. So just remember to talk about them and think about them yourself in a way that's really about education and learning. And that's such a powerful way to get your funders, your friends group, your managers on board with what you're doing. Um, so that's a really awesome jumping off point. And now let's talk a little bit specifically about how we can engage adults in play. Uh, come on, presentation. All right, so getting dirty. Hands-on projects are one of the fastest and most fulfilling ways to immediately make your programs more engaging. I love this particular shot. This girl showed up to this program in this like really pretty dress and then proceeded to just stick her arms up to the elbows in what we were making, which was, I was so excited. <laughs> So doing something yourself is just inherently more meaningful than having somebody else talk to you about doing it, right? This is a big part of where the maker movement is coming from. People have realized that to live fulfilling lives, they have to reclaim their ability to create and not just consume. So the term maker is often associated with technology, but hands-on programs that teach people enriching life skills can also be completely analog. Um, in fact, some of those less shiny skills can be even more important because a lot of people no longer learn them. You know, sewing on a button, making your own bath products rather than buying some overpriced and chemical-filled synthetic, both useful and awesome. Um, so it's even more important and attractive, these analog, hands-on programs for working adults who probably spend most of their days in front of the screen until they feel like this. So best of all, hands-on programs are really deeply in keeping with one of the most exciting, relevant aspects of library services, uh, which, by the way, <laughs> is also the oldest and most enduring. Melville Dewey didn't exactly use this term, but libraries have always been about radical sharing. 
we may think of libraries of lending books and freely sharing information um, as that, that sort of the stuffy, no longer relevant piece of library services, right? But this kind of sharing is subversive, radical, and it is becoming more so. The whole idea behind lending books is that you can be your own expert. You are empowered to do and create and think anything you can imagine, regardless of what is popular or mainstream. So in a world where everything is continually more commoditized and prepackaged, the idea that we can grow and learn ourselves without paying an expert is transformative and it's deeply empowering. So when we teach people how to create things for themselves, for free, in ways that resonate with their own values, I mean, in this culture, that is astonishing. It is rare and it is extremely valuable. So that's why so many adults of all ages, especially those younger adults that, you know, 20 to 35 bracket are looking to return to making and sharing. They're seeking out old style homemaking skills and homesteading skills and shutting the consumer economy for the sharing. So this really radical aspect of making is what libraries are about, what they have always been about. And so programs like this really just bring our mission into today's world. And they're fun, so no wonder people show up. Uh, along these lines, here's an example of a series that I do with these. It's called Radical Home Economics. And it focuses on home skills, although I especially like to blur the lines between home crafts and technology. Uh, for example, this winter we wired up LED holiday cards. Um, we've made non-toxic cleaners. We've infused herbs into soap. Um, some things I want to do in the future include some simple home electronics repair, um, using that conductive wiring to sew, um, like the conductive thread, I mean, to sew light up stuffed animals. Um, we've also made your own spa products out of kitchen ingredients, made homemade cocoa mix as a gift, and made hyper tufa pots. Um, and you can feel free to email me, by the way. My email will be at the end for tutorials on any of these um, or any of the programs that I talk about today. Happy to share. So here is the key to this series of programs. This is really important. Participants finish what they make. Having a finished product to take home without more work to do on it is really exciting. It's satisfying. It gives people something to show off and be proud of. It gives them a sense of accomplishment, and it gears them up to want to tackle bigger projects on their own. And it doesn't hurt that it also gives them something they made at the library to show off to all their friends. So the picture on the lower right is from that uh, Hypertufa Pots workshop. Uh, Hypertufa, if you haven't worked with it, is a fake stone. Um, it's light, it's durable, and it can be molded into any shape. Um, so this program was so popular I had to run it twice, and it filled up with a huge waiting list both times. And it is so perfect for a library program. First of all, it's a mess. <laughs> it is a big mess. So that's fun, and it immediately gets people in the room to laugh and bond. Um, also, making hypertufa requires working with concrete, and that's intimidating to a lot of people, so it's something they're unlikely to try on their own. However, it's actually very easy to do. So once people have learned how, they can't wait to go home and get creative with it. So we can really introduce something new and useful to people in a community setting um, that empowers them to go and learn and do more on their own. Excuse me, Audrey? Yes. Could you um, spell the name of that product you mentioned? I had a few people ask. Oh, Hypertufa, yes. H-Y-P-E-R-T-U-F-A. And they sell, so you can buy like commercial mixes for making it, don't bother, it's really like three ingredients. Um, there's a tutorial, um, I adapted mine from Lowe's.com, um, and it's uh, concrete, not the quick drying stuff, or um, Portland cement rather, um, peat moss, uh, perlite, and water. So you can actually get these ingredients really inexpensively. Okay, so thank like, you. I got mine at the Ace Harbor, yeah. <laughs> thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Um, so the picture on the left um, was from a program on bridges. And it would have been really easy to do that as a lecture, right? An engineer could have come in, showed slides of famous bridges, talked about structure, there goes your hour. Um, and people would have come, mostly our regular audience, and it would have been a nice program. But instead, we had just a few minutes of presenting. And then people actually built paper models of one of the types of the bridges they had just seen. This attracted a really wide audience, and it was incredibly engaging. They learned so much more deeply than they would have if it were just a lecture. And we attracted a wide audience. Some seniors came because they wanted to learn how to do this with their grandchildren. Some middle-aged adults came because they had gone to architecture or engineering school, and now we're doing something else, and they missed the sort of creative, hands-on part of that work. Some of them are just 
people interested in bridges of all ages or people who thought it sounded fun. So the best part was not only did they build the bridges, they then tested them for failure by loading them up with rolls of pennies until they collapsed, which is what you're seeing in those uh, bottom two pieces of the quartet. So just imagine a room full of adults leaning forward and standing on their tiptoes to get the best view over someone else's head and like jumping up and down and screaming and clapping like school kids when the bridges collapsed. Um, and I say like school kids because I happen to know that it was exactly like a room full of school kids because we started this as a children's program. Uh, I just made a few modifications and repeated it for adults um, after <laughs> quite a few people asked me when it was going to be their turn. So look to your children and teen librarians when you need ideas. They're already providing a lot of fantastic hands-on education that appeals to the kid in all of us. Right? I mean, if think about how many people at Young People's Programs, how many parents have sort of added a wistful, when are you going to do this for me? Listen to them. Do it. <laughs> You never outgrow that stuff. All right, so back to the ball pit. Uh, join in. In the chat box, why don't you add some of your own ideas for fun programs that are um, uh, that are uh, getting dirty, hands on. All right. So dirty programs. Um, while people are entering things in the box, um, Leah has a question. Um, Audrey, um, mm -hmm. she asked, do teens ever express interest in these programs, and if so, are they welcome to come, or do you try to keep it just for adults? Sure. Um, thank you for asking. So teens definitely express interest in these programs. First of all, sometimes I'm stealing the idea basically directly from them. So, um, <laughs> And the answer is, is sometimes. Um, there are some programs, um, and I have an example of this later, where they work really well with all ages programs. Um, but to take a lesson from the teens themselves, right, I mean, most of the time when we have teen programs, we don't let people of other ages in, right, because the teens will stop coming if their programs get packed full of, like, precocious nine-year-olds and, like, creepy adults. <laughs> <laughs> so it's the, it's the same for, um, for adults. It's, you know, no one wants to do something goofy or feel like they're going to fail in front of their high school kids' friends. Um, so... For some, it's okay, but um, for some, I do limit it to uh, 21 plus. Okay. Um, the Radical Home Act program, I let people of all ages come, and it's great. They work together. They have a good time. You know, they sort of share their different levels of knowledge. Okay, thank you. Um, some things that came in, um, I'm seeing dish gardens, um, building little free libraries, gardening, cooking, mm -hmm. art, um, composting, or composting. Um, Cartooning, card making, um, paint a chair for the community, 4th oh, of fun. July parade as seating for parade watchers, uh, knitting. Cool. Excellent. All right. So the next aspect to successful, vibrant learning for adults is getting together. Right? One person alone in a room at home can create a craft or a project or one of the hands-on things we've talked about and get many of those maker culture benefits. But how often do they get to do it in a room full of other people where they can share ideas, get inspired and motivated, and build the relationships that make the experience really meaningful? These social settings are really getting a lot harder to find, and they are what will keep people coming back to your programs at the end of the day. So back to our Jedi Master. Um, we have to unlearn the idea that learning is a solitary process that takes place between one person and one piece of information. All learning at its core is social. Even if you're learning by sitting alone reading a book, your social context is what gives meaning and power to what you learn. So of course we thrive in environments where that social nature is exists, where we can teach and inspire each other. When there's someone else to hand you the glue or to help you talk out your idea, to encourage you and support you, challenge you, just to give you a high five, right? Because doing that yourself is no fun for anybody. But it's getting harder and harder to find free places to make those vital new social connections that really make a community vibrant. Your social library programs can help people forge meaningful, lasting connections that tie them to each other and to the library. All right, let's see who's paying attention. <laughs> Trivia break. In Great Expectations, what is Pip's full name? Just go ahead and toss your answer into the chat box. Okay, I see it. Like. Mm -hmm. I see a D A C 
fee. Never read that one. <laughs> um, mostly getting A's and C's. All right. So you guys are right on. The answer is C, Philip Pira. Okay. So if you were like, you know, waving your hand around on your side of the screen, then you would be the perfect participant for one of my program's books on tap. Uh, this monthly program gets people together um, at a bar to play literary pub trivia. Um, so it meets um, at this bar and restaurant that's on the side of town furthest from the library. People get into teams and they compete for glory through four rounds of trivia based on a list of 50 books. Uh, here's a sample piece of one of those book lists. The list stays in play for six months, um, which encourages people to keep reading and get ahead for the next month. Um, and they usually get straight to strategizing. They form up some regular teams. They divvy up the books so they can get maximum coverage. And I just love, love, love hearing people who were perfect strangers suddenly talking and laughing and building community through this conversation around great books. They swap recommendations, they rave about their favorites, and they debate the details when they disagree on an answer. Um, and it's really the social nature of this game that bonds people and keeps them coming back. And it encourages them to read more, read widely, and read closely. Because it's fun and social, it does a better job than a less exciting program of getting people to read and discuss books. I mean, that's a win. <laughs> uh, here's another example. I just absolutely adore adult murder mystery programs. Um, so you've probably seen kits for these, especially for teens, to <laughs> go back to that question earlier. Um, I write my own, um, but you know, either way works. Um, so we hold them after hours, because even adults get a little bit excited about a library lock-in. Uh, when participants arrive, they are welcomed as though they were at the library to attend some other kind of event, like a party or a play. Then they are interrupted with the announcement that a crime has been committed, and only they can solve it. So players get a list of the suspects with short descriptions of who they are, which is in the guise of some kind of handout or program for that supposed real event. Um, armed with a basic understanding of the suspects, they search the library looking for clues. So I usually stage three scenes, and I hide clues in the stacks um, in what I've noted as the suspect's favorite books. Uh, so, for example, one murder mystery took place during an author awards dinner. Uh, the scenes were the dining space, the caterer's kitchen, and the speech podium. Um, searching usually takes about an hour. Once the players are done searching, I gather them back together in our meeting room. Um, any area you've got with a screen and a projector or a TV would work fine. So I've pre-recorded some videos of the suspect's statements to the police. Um, so the players really get to hear from the suspects, but I also don't have to worry about getting a large cast of people to all show up that night and remember their lines. Um, players fill out slips of paper to guess who did the dastardly deed. Um, and then they see another set of video clips of the suspects who reveal the truth. And then um, my raffle off prize is usually arcs um, to the detectives to get it right. So at first, I had envisioned these as adult-only programs as sort of a counterpoint to the teen programs. Um, but it wasn't long before people started calling in and asking if they could bring their whole family, um, kids, grandmas, the works, and some teens who had done their own murder mystery nights really wanted to come too. So I said, what the heck, you know, <laughs> bring everybody. And the result was fantastic. Three generations of family came and worked together. Groups of 20-somethings came. We had a couple on a date um, who came back a couple months later to let us know they were pregnant. <laughs> so we felt responsible, you know. <laughs> um, so groups of older women ditched their husbands at home and came for a girls' night. We had like gaggles of teens running around through the stacks, and I swear that I have never seen anybody so excited to use the catalog. I mean, it's really not every day that you hear like unvarnished excitement as someone starts yelling, come here, I found the call number. So it was, it was great. People of all ages really speculate together, share ideas, they told each other clues, they formed these sort of temporary alliances and rivalries. Um, that's incredible value for the community. Right? There just aren't that many opportunities anymore for people of different generations to socialize. We really tend to stratify into age-specific groups. So through this fun and social program, the library took a step towards helping people form bonds with those of other generations. Some uh, people kept asking, when's next month? <laughs> I almost died. These are time consuming. Um, I, I just do one or two a year, um, but they, they really are worth every minute. Um, and in this case, including people of all ages did not hurt our attendance with um, with adults, even that sort of target emerging adult population. Uh, 
All right. A little more time to chat. So what kinds of programs have you done or would you like to do that are social in nature? Okay, social programs. What do you mean by that exactly, more and more so, specifically? Sure. So <laughs> programs that really focus on where the, the main draw, even if you're doing an activity, is about building community, right, where you're getting people together to do something. Okay. So not a lecture where everyone's facing forward, you know, something where people face each other. They actually have to talk to each other. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I know, it's terrifying, isn't it? <laughs> Um, okay, so I'm seeing a knitting club, intergenerational, we, uh, nice. board, board game nights, uh, scavenger hunt, senior we bowling league, um, mystery plus potluck, cooks and books. Mm. Um, we do a free coffee house every month just for the social aspect, not a book discussion, nothing wrong with that. Um, coffee and book chat. Um, we are... Bring your favorite appetizer to share, a recipe swap, card playing, um, title swap, librarians and patrons share the best books they have read, conversation and crafts night, hooks and needles club, genealogy class. Um, every winter we have outfit making for the younger siblings. Hmm. Hmm. Uh, we, have the, we have the word shop, which is a dynamic writers group here. Great. Excellent. So tons of awesome ideas. Like I said, I am, I'm totally, but I heard someone at one point say, uh, it was at a conference and she, the presenter said, uh, R&D, rip off and duplicate. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Yeah. You know, um, these are, we all are doing amazing things and have great ideas and it's fantastic to be sharing them like this. All right. Finally, get out of the library. So you know those people that you're trying to reach, right? The ones who aren't already using the library? So you're fighting a pretty steep uphill battle to get them to come to you, no matter how fantastic your program is. Right? It's not that you don't have anything to offer them, but it's just that they aren't thinking to look where you are. So don't bang your head against the wall, just go to where they are. So where are the people in your community gathering, right? That's going to be a little bit different for each of us, but in my community, it's on board the ferry. Bainbridge Island is a 35-minute ferry ride from Seattle, so um, more than a third of our working adult population commutes regularly. I mean, those people are riding this boat essentially twice a day, five days a week. So that inspired me to start Fairy Tales, um, a book group that meets on board the ferry. So when I, I would ride the ferry myself, I would always see lots of people reading, but a lot of these readers aren't, they're not faces that I was seeing in the library, right? They're not library users. They're busy professionals, they often go home after the library has closed for the evening, um, or they're too tired or too busy to make time during open hours. So I went to them. Uh, this started out, uh, it's just a simple book group, right? It's exactly like the one you probably are running at your own library, um, although it does have to happen in half an hour. And it's been immensely successful. I have a strong regular group of participants. Um, most are regular commuters, although I actually have some who ride the ferry just to come to the group. Um, and even the regular commuters have taken to making a special trip when they have the day off, um, you know, some kind of schedule shift. Um, a lot of my participants didn't even have library cards before they joined this group. But now they spend their commute reading a library book from one of our book group kits, they discuss it at the group, and um, they chat about it at other times during the month, right? They see each other every day on the boat, and I get little tidbits of, you know, well, when I was talking to Janet last week, she said blah, blah, blah. Um, so they're engaging with it all month long. Um, and now that the library has made that connection with them, they've also started attending programs in the library buildings. Um, they're some of the biggest advocates of my murder mystery programs. Not only do they attend them themselves, but they started bringing their family and their friends and talking about them to their coworkers. Um, if I stopped offering these, I think they would throw me overboard. <laughs> so the effect of doing something a little original has just also gone well beyond the direct participants. Fairy Tales has gotten a huge amount of publicity locally and nationally. And it's been in the local paper and several magazines, on the evening news, and then it's been in industry publications as well and was one of the um, major reasons that I was chosen as a mover and shaker this year. Um, so local publicity has really gotten people excited about the library, even if they don't participate in the group. They think about us, they kind of smile, and then they stop in or they check out the Facebook page or they mention it to a friend. 
Right? I get recognized in the grocery store and on the street where people feel comfortable asking me questions about the library because of this. Um, also, we've done some hiring lately, and I think that the notoriety for the system um, from these programs, I hope, has helped us um, attract some of the excellent applicants that we've gotten from around the country. So that, of course, helps us offer even more and better programs. Audrey? So here's another way that this has kind of blossomed beyond what I was expecting. Mm -hmm. yes. um, I have two questions. Um, so how, so you notice people on the, the ferry reading. How, how did you approach them, or how did that get started? Because I, I could imagine that that might be intimidating for some people. Like they have, or just maybe not on a ferry, but they have, they, they're seeing a trend in their community, and they don't know how to start, or they don't know how to <laughs> approach people, because that, be, that can be daunting. So how did, how did you do it? Sure, it, it is, and it was. Um, <laughs> it didn't go well the first time, actually. So, um, what I did was I decided to sort of frame it as action research, so I put together a little like quarter sheet survey. Would you be interested in participating in okay. a group like this? What would you, you know, what kinds of things do you like to read, and what's your email address? Um, so first of all, that actually allowed me to put together my first um, email list, so I had some people to advertise to right away. Um, right. And it was sort of a, a, a nice opening to talk to people, like, will you take my survey, instead of like, hi, I'm a random stranger. Um, and it actually, it turned out to be really important to start with, hi, I'm from the library. And <laughs> then people immediately <laughs> sort of were like, oh, this is not a person who's trying to sell me something, this is right. someone that I'm prone to like. Um, so the first time that I tried to do this, I had thought about having this um, group for morning commuters. And I rode that ferry in the morning, and I approached people who like weren't embroiled in conversation and didn't have their headphones in. Um, mm. I especially, you know, targeted people who were reading, and people were so mean to me. <laughs> they really were. <laughs> you know, they just like didn't want to be bothered in the morning. Right. That's their. They've got a routine. That's their time. Right. They're tired. They've got stuff to do. Don't talk to me. <laughs> right. Exactly. So then, you know, I sort of like went home and. Put a little bit of ball for the night, and then I went out the next day on the afternoon ferry for the return commute, and it was great. You know, okay. it's just a totally different mindset. People are in a whole different place. Um, so it didn't go well the first time, and I thought about why, and <laughs> tried it again, and it was great. So um, it is a little intimidating, especially if you're not a people person, but it's it's really fine. And once you get going, and you find sort of the right atmosphere, and you know, don't give up. It actually it actually becomes a lot of fun. It really does. You know, you're chatting with people and they get excited about what you're doing and they want to tell the person next to them and it becomes a lot easier once you just get over that hump of getting started. So I guess the moral is, you know, don't give up if you get um, people who aren't interested right away. You kind of have to keep at it a little bit. Yeah, definitely. Another uh, question that came in, since we're kind of on this, um, is Nick wants to know a little bit more about the satellite items that you're checking out at the fairy tale events and how, how does that work exactly? Yeah. So our system has book groups where you check out, um, you just check out the kit and then whoever does that is responsible for like the 15 books and maybe an audio book or a large print that's inside. So I check out a book group kit and I distribute those books to my group um, when they're on the ferry so they don't have to come in. Um, and then they just bring them back to me the next month and I trade them for the new one. Okay. So yeah, so that works well. Um, we don't have a system that lets us do like actual remote checkout. Um, I would really, really love it if we did. That's something that I'm hoping for in the near future. Okay, great. Thank you. All right. Yeah, thank you. So, um, as you can sort of already see, once you get something going, it becomes really easy for it to grow beyond its original confines. If you're programming, say yes. Right? Let things go in directions that you never expected and that maybe seem kind of scary. Um, because the result can be really exciting. So I started, once the, we started getting some publicity, I started getting contacted by authors and publicists who'd read about fairy tales and they wanted to participate. Right? Because the program is fun, it captured their imagination and they wanted to volunteer, um, which wouldn't have happened for a program that didn't have that sort of you know, fun element to it. So um, I thought, well, how can I incorporate them? We don't necessarily have those book group kits um, for um, for everyone who wants to participate. Um, so this past spring we expanded Fairy Tales um, and we added a second once a month author event. So we kicked off with uh, best-selling author Susan Wiggs um, and then we also get to spotlight wonderful lesser known authors in our area like Bernadette Pager. And we've hosted authors of fiction, nonfiction, actually the 
the children's book authors have been very popular on the ferry. Um, so the author rides on board and they do a reading or they give a talk or a Q&A. Um, we've, so we've had some great local authors, but we've also been contacted by those passing through the area, uh, like Lori King, which was a lot of fun. So um, then something even more neat came out of this, which is we got contacted by Shira Kashiba, um, who is a very well-known sushi chef. If you've seen that movie, Jiro Dreams of Sushi, um, Shiro was his protege. So um, he came out with a, like a cookbook memoir and contacted us about sort of doing the, you know, part of the release push. And I thought, well, it's kind of a shame to have a sushi chef and not serve sushi, right? Um, but we can't serve food on the ferry. And so I thought, well, this new business had just opened up in downtown um, called Intentional Table that had a commercial kitchen and did, you know, cooking demos and meals and had a little retail shop. So I got in touch with them. And it was the, the they said one of the best attended programs that they had ever had. Um, we literally were spilling out into the street and it was pouring rain that day. And people still came and they stayed and they met Shiro and they got their book signed and he actually demoed some sushi making and gave them tastes. It was fantastic. Um, the publisher loved it. Intentional Table loved it. And so a lot of other um, partnerships have come out of that. I now run a cookbook book group once a month at Intentional Table. Um, and I've stayed in touch with that publisher about working with some of their other authors. So those connections that you make when you get outside the library, that's just one of the best things about doing it. Um, you make connections with individuals that you wouldn't normally reach, and you make connections with organizations that maybe you hadn't thought to partner with um, or hadn't realized how far that partnership could go. And it just, it snowballs like crazy. Get out of the building. <laughs> Audrey, where do you advertise those posters? Oh, yeah. So um, we've got them in the library, like, you know, where we would normally have them. Um, we always distribute our posters. Our downtown strip is pretty poster friendly. Um, so, you know, there's a bunch of community billboards and most of the shops let us put them up in their windows. Um, and then the, the ferry terminal also has a billboard, um, like a, you know, community poster board. So they put these up there as well. Okay. Thank you. Um, yeah. When we first started, they've got like screens and we bought some advertising on the screens. Um, and that was neat, but, you know, not something that we can do all the time. And then do you need permission to post stuff from the transit authority? Yeah, so we've actually worked really closely uh, with Washington State Ferries. I wanted, okay. it's a, the ferry is a public space, um, so I guess I technically maybe didn't need permission in order to host the book group there, but I wanted it. Um, so yeah. I worked with the operations manager at the ferry, and that really, you know, created that partnership. She's on our side. She's advocated for us. Um, you know, Absolutely. She, um, yeah, they make an announcement on the ferry when I ride. You know, oh, that's cool. Yeah. <laughs> There's a librarian on board. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. You know, I even wind up like chatting with the ferry workers about what they're reading. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. Very cool. It's, re it's really fun. It's really fun. Um, so I'll return briefly to uh, Books on Tap um, because that also is outside the building. It meets in a, in a bar. Um, so, of course, by being outside the building, we're um, reaching people who normally hang out at the bar instead of at the library. Um, but there's plenty of readers there, too. So this is one of those other little advertising tricks. This is a Books on Tap coaster. Um, so we gave them to the bar, and they just distribute it to their regular right, customers. And it's been a really great tool for advertising to um, their patrons as well as to our usual base. Um, so we reach people who already spend time in this environment and who are comfortable there. So they're much more likely to want to go back there for an event than to come to a library that they've never visited, right, even for the same program. Plus, you know, you can have a nosh and a glass of wine or a beer. It definitely doesn't hurt. Um, and I actually do want to emphasize the importance of that for a second. Um, it's not because... The importance isn't really that people can drink, although, you know, that does sort of, like, increase the cool factor. Um, but it's because it makes really clear that this program is truly 21 plus only. So it's a signal to adults looking at our publicity materials that this is actually a fun program that's just for them. But people don't expect that. They often expect fun library programs to be for teens or for kids. Um, and they know that they're not going to get there and discover that they're going to look silly in front of a bunch of kids. 
Right. Um, so I mentioned this earlier when we had a question, but teen librarians learned a really long time ago that teens are not going to come to a program that's full of people way outside of their age bracket. Um, so to be successful with teen programs, right, we just target them specifically to teens. This is just the same concept. It's a way of signaling to adults that this is just for them, and that makes them a lot more likely to want to come. Um, and in, in an environment like this, a program that's competitive, that's definitely really important. Um, so we've already done a little bit of chatting, but go ahead and um, toss in your own ideas for programs that you've tried or would like to try that are outside of your building. All right, so programs that you've done outside the library. Um, while we're waiting for those, I had a couple questions come in, Audrey. Um, how, does the cook, how does the cookbook book group work? Yeah, so that actually is brand new. We just had our first meeting yesterday, so um, ask me in six months. But um, <laughs> as, at least the way it's working right now um, is we pick out a cookbook in advance. We had talked about maybe doing themes, like everyone gets a cookbook on Italian food, and then we swap you know, ideas and recipes. Um, but for a variety of reasons, we thought it would just be easier, at least now, to pick a specific book. Um, so we started with Jerusalem um, by Otto Lenghi. Um, which is just one of those cookbooks that, you know, it's it's on trend, but also every, it's not, like, too fussy. Everyone really seems to like it. Um, so we had a nice big group that came. Some people had tried some recipes out of the book already. Um, some just had ones they wanted to try. So we chatted about the recipes. We talked about sort of the narrative of the book. And then the folks at Intentional Table who were hosting um, also prepared several dishes out of the book that everyone could taste. Excellent. So that was really fun. They do it for free, um, and the reason for that is that they're able to sell a lot of books, <laughs> so of it works out, and it gets a lot of people into the store. We we do pick books that we have at the library, but, you know, we have, like, a couple of copies, so that's a little bit of a compromise there, but people don't seem to mind. It's been, at least so far, there's been a lot of interest, and I had a great time. It was fun. Okay. Um, so when you do the programs off-site, you count, you count those numbers in your annual reports and that sort of thing, correct? Oh, yeah, definitely. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I mean, you've heard that, like, old, the old saw, right, like a, a room full of, you know, a library full of books with no people in it is a, is a, is a book warehouse and an empty room <laughs> for librarian and it is a library. Yeah. You know, it's, if, you, if you're there and you're the librarian and you're representing your library, you know, that's, that's library. It counts, library. absolutely. Okay, so getting to our, some of the things that people shared on stuff outside the library, um, Carolyn says we try to poke a run. Um, I'm seeing programs at the local nature center, a movie series in our elderly housing. Um, Leah, Leah says we did um, a movie field trip to the theater after reading the book. Um, Terry does a Kindle cafe, teaches about the library's ebook collection at local coffee shops. Oh, fun. Um, let's see, a book discussion on assisted living. Um, Betty said I would like to try a books on the beach books club. Oh, fun. Um, I think Racine has a, a Bonk series, an arts performance series focused on poetry and music held at a local gallery. Um, let's see. E-reader workshop and device petting zoo at the senior centers. Hike at the local state park. So a lot of stuff. Awesome. So I hope a lot of you have seen what, what I've been seeing, which is that a lot of these just snowball, right? You do one thing out of the library, and you get new people, and they tell other new people, or you meet, you know, you get acquainted with other organizations, and then they come up with new ideas for ways to partner with you. It's just, it's this amazing way to exponentially increase your reach in the community. And people are really excited to see you out there, you know? They like feeling the presence of their library. All right, so just a little recap. Don't be afraid to get dirty. Everything's better with companions. And get out of your building. Okay, so we've been chatting for a little bit, but um, just this is just a good open time that I left for questions. Um, if you want to go ahead and add those to the chat box. I will uh, flip ahead and let you know that any resources um, that I've used, places I go for ideas, um, any articles that I mentioned, um, you can get them here on the resource page. Um, and here is my contact information. And you're welcome to get in touch with me. 
Excellent. Well, we do have about a good 10 minutes left um, for questions, and I'm seeing some come in, and we've answered a lot already, which is awesome. Um, so Amy wants to know, do you create all the questions for Books on Tap, and how many librarians are in the group? You know, that's a great question. So um, when I started, it was just me, and it was a lot. It was too much work. Um, I just didn't have enough time. So I started trying to encourage other staff to answer questions. Um, or to, you know, to create questions, and a little gentle pushing was not doing the trick. Oh, um, so Audrey, what I ended up doing, mm -hmm. could, you, could, you, could you put your contact page back up? People are asking. <laughs> thank you. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Um, oh, yeah, no, thank you. Um, oh, so what I ended up doing was um, putting a bowl with some Hershey's Kisses and about five books off the list and some slips. Um, with space to write a question and answer on them in our break room so that when people were on break they could flip through, write a question, um, accept their chocolate bribe. Um, and that, that was okay. Um, I found that I got a lot of duplicate questions that way because people would sort of like look at the first few pages. Um, ultimately what I ended up doing that was very successful is I have, um, we have a really strong group of volunteers here and I've essentially turned the whole thing over to volunteers at this point. Um, I have one really fantastic volunteer who is a librarian herself and used for library journal and is just loves books and loves reading and so um, she actually writes the majority of the questions for me now. Um, I fill in where I need to um, and I have some other volunteers who will fill in as they can as well. Um, but that's really been the best the best solution. Um, right now it's been um, this program has sort of lived at my branch um, so I've taken responsibility for it but um, as I was saying about snowballing, some other branches have started to get interested in it. Some of their like local bars and restaurants have contacted them and said, hey, will you do this here? Um, so hopefully we'll spread the, the work out a little bit that way as well. Great. Um, did, did you have enough of the cookbook to, or did you make copies? Yeah, so um, we just had a couple copies in the system and um, beyond that, people could um, could pick one, you know, they could leave through at the book or they could buy one at intentional table. Um, normally I wouldn't do a book group if I didn't have adequate copies of the book, but that was sort of the trade-off for intentional table, which is a, a commercial business that is, you know, fairly new and needs the cash flow to be willing to hold an event for free in their space. Great. Um, so do you have a budget for all of your programs, I assume? Yeah, I have a fairly small programming budget, actually. Um, a lot of what I'm doing is is um, is not actually relying on money. I mean, fairy tales, right? We've got the book group kits in the system. The only cost is is my time. Um, the authors we've been using are all people who have volunteered um, to come. So, and actually, but they can't even sell their books on the ferry. So, um, it's really you know just uh, for fun and to. Um, to drum up some buzz for them. Um, books on tap, um, the only even potential cost would, you know, the trivia on the book list, that's my time. Um, the only potential cost would be for a lot of these things are prizes um, and the friends donate some of their um, used books and those are really popular or we'll use ARCs. Um, the only thing I have that has a significant cost are those radical home ec programs, um, supplies, are pricey, so that's basically where my entire programming budget goes. Um, for one-off special events, um, I'll apply to the Friends or the Foundation for some money. Okay, but I'm great. not working on a huge budget. Okay. Um, and I know. Some, would you mind going back to your reference page, please, Audrey? Okay. Thank you. And just so you all know, um, the slides. Um, are, will be available as well as the uh, recording. So if there's something you didn't get down, um, that will all be sent in your, your follow-up email. Um, did you, so did you approach the people first on the ferry, or did they kind of join in after you started talking to people? I believe you said you, um, you approached them first. Is that correct? Yeah, um, it was a little bit of both ways. So I mean, first I sort of went out and drummed up interest as best I could. And then once we got going, you know, people would see us or someone who I had talked to would sort of pull in other people that they knew. Um. Excellent. Um, Kim asks, can we go back to the murder mystery? It sounds like something I'd like to do. Where did you get the information on starting that or how did you start that? Yeah, so, oh, 
Oh, um, so that hosting a library murder mystery, a programming guide that you see on here, um, that was sort of where I started. Um, I'd seen a bunch of different kinds, and I wasn't really, I'd never done one, and I wasn't sure how I was going to put it together. Um, so I started there um, with that book. It's an ALA publication. Um, and that really gave me an idea of what options were out there. And then I sort of cobbled together my own just based on the bits that I liked and thought would work well in my library. Awesome. All right, well, I'm not seeing anything else come in at the moment. Um, Audrey, I asked the, the last people this question. I guess what would your ideal, um, I guess if money or time weren't an issue or anything else, what would your ideal library look like or what would, um, what would an adult, what would an adult oriented space look like at your library? Mm. That's <laughs> a great question. Um, I guess a, a really good balance between space for collaboration and space for quiet. You know, there people, books absolutely are still an important part of our brand and people want them and they come here for them and they come here to engage with them in a quiet and comfortable space. Um, okay. So I want to preserve that, but also to, you know, just have more space for people to make and do and collaborate. You know, I feel like sure. we sometimes talk about the libraries being kind of consumptive, right, that it's about people taking in information, and I don't think that's ever been true. It's always been about, you know, people taking that information and then, you know, they read a book about tiling their bathroom, and then they tile their bathroom. Sure. <laughs> or they even read, a, like, a piece of fiction, you know, and then they live their lives in a in a better or fuller way. Um, so I'd just like to see space for that explicitly. And I guess kind of dovetailing on that, um, so one of our speakers for tomorrow, um, CJ, will be talking about um, creative maker spaces. And um, um, they have a one of those spaces at the Cleveland Library, but he'll, he's going to tell us that you don't need a lot of space. Actually, he, you know, he said that even just providing a table at your library for people to meet at works great. So if you want to tune in on that, um, that's at that's at two thirty. Um, anything else you'd like to add, Audrey, before we um, sign off? Yes, just thank you for coming, and um, really do feel free to get in touch with me if you want any materials or you have any questions. All right. Thank you so much, Audrey. Thank you, everyone else, for joining in. Um, our next session will start up at 2.30. Um, that's on metrics with Emily Clasper. So for those of you joining in for that one, we will talk to you then. If not, have a great rest of your day, and so long. <laughs>